Today, tonight, we have a distinct pleasure to kick off a integral part of this retreat um, and this conference. And it's part of what we do on a regular basis here. And that is use the opportunity that you are in Jerusalem to have you meet unique and exceptional individuals who have something very important to say about the reality which is this place. Um, and for you to be able to hear from them, to learn from them, um, and uh, to understand this place by taking a journey through their eyes. One of the most articulate, thoughtful, sensitive, looks like I have 12 more adjectives. Uh, <laughs> One of the best journalists and commentators, not just on the reality which is Israel, um, but on Israel's soul. Not simply on, if you want to know what's happening, go one place. If you want to understand what's happening, it would be really smart for you to listen to Yossi Klein Halev. Um, and, uh, Tonight, not only are we going to get, take a journey um, through you, but we're going, to get, we're going to have a unique opportunity to celebrate one of the most important books, I believe, in our lifetime, which has come out on the state of Israel. And that's Yossi's book, Like Dreamers, um, which, by the way, is also going to be available for book signing after tonight's um, uh, event. Um, there, sometimes you write a book and your mother buys 75% of the copies. <laughs> and that's one of the things that mothers are for. <laughs> and that's it, I love you, and you go and you, you know, they go into the bookstore, do you have my son's book? You know, they have the book and they didn't. There's certain people. Sometimes you write a book that shapes and changes the way people are going to understand things. And we are very fortunate this last year that two books came out at the same time. Uh, two books which are going to shape the way people think and talk about Israel, I believe, for a very, very long time. And this conference, you're going to have an opportunity um, to hear both. And um, tonight um, is Yossi's night. And... Um, as uh, this is your home. And it's really, it's, and it's, it's nothing less than an honor, um, not simply to celebrate what you created, um, but to talk to you about it. And uh, to try, I'm assuming that everybody here obviously has read the book and purchased numerous copies um, <laughs> for your mother. <laughs> uh, um, but tonight is our opportunity to hear from you. Um, not to recount what's in the book, but to understand the deeper implications of this book for what Zionism means and for what this country is about. Because that, this is a lens to understand what, who we are and what this state of Israel is. And so, first, welcome. Uh, second, um, Kola Kavod. Um, you gave all of us a gift. Truly, truly a gift. Maybe let's start by thanking Yossi. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to kick it off, and what we're going to do is I'm going to interview Yossi for a little bit, and he's going to speak, and then, event and then we'll open it up for questions from you. Um, why did you start writing about 67? Why was that the starting point um, that you believe is a good lens to understand Israel? Israel started in 47 or in the early 9th, 20th century? Or is there something profound or is there something that you want to teach us by actually picking 67 as the lens which you believe we have to wear to understand Israel today? Uh, well, first of all, Danielle, thank you. And uh, I've been speaking about this book for, uh, for many months. <clears throat> I've been speaking about this book for, for months uh, in North America. And this really is a homecoming for me. 
This is, uh, I've been so looking forward to this moment when I could be speaking about this book here in Jerusalem at the Machon with all of you and especially with you, Danielle. So thank you. Thank you. And in terms of uh, the, the starting point of 67, I actually initially in, in one of the many drafts of the book began in 1950. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, the book would have been 800 pages <laughs> instead of 600. <laughs> and, uh, and it was in fact 800 pages until about six months before it was published. And uh, as my editor put it, it's your funeral. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and you know, if she would have told me you can't do it, I would have insisted. She said, go ahead and bury yourself. So I cut 200 pages. And, uh, and, and I realized, though, that uh, this wasn't just a, um, a, a coerced uh, tactic, but there was really a substantive statement uh, in, in choosing to, to begin the book in May 1967, in the weeks leading up to the Six Day War. And I'd say that there was a personal reason and a, um, and a more of a collective Jewish reason. Personally, I came of age in, in my relationship with Israel in May 1967. I was 14 and watching the scenes on TV coming from Cairo, Damascus, that was the moment when I realized, as I think many of us did, how much Israel means to us. I was, I was a Jewish kid in Brooklyn and suddenly Israel was the most important part of my life. And as soon as the war ended, my father said, we're going to Israel. And it was so unusual in those years that all of my friends from eighth grade came to the airport to see me off. And they all came, they were all at the airport to welcome me back. How was it? What happened? And that was really the summer of, uh, the summer of love. It was the summer of love in San Francisco, uh, but it was also the summer of love in Israel. It was uh, a summer uh, where we stopped being a dysfunctional family and became very briefly a, uh, a happy ever after family. Was anybody here in the summer of 67? So uh, no one. So this was really the, the moment for me when I decided I have to be here. Now Israel didn't quite turn out the way it seemed to be turning out uh, that summer. Uh, nevertheless, it was really a, um, a, a moment, uh, it was a messianic moment, as I think San Francisco 1967 was a kind of a messianic moment. So, so the, personal, the personal, I'd say that what I was trying to do for myself was understand what happened to that summer. How did we dissipate that? And, and, and in truth, one could never hold on to that kind of ecstasy. But how did we get from the summer of 67 and the sense of happy ever after to this moment uh, of uh, wondering uh, what's the future of the country? And many Israelis feel it, and I think many Jews around the world feel it. And uh, it's, it's a reflection, I think, of a certain manic depressive nature in Jewish life, where we're either redeemed or we're on the edge of apocalypse. So I wanted to go back to that moment when we all believed that we were redeemed and to see, to unfold the story and to tell it as a story, to tell it through the lives of a group of paratroopers who had fought in Jerusalem. So, so for me, it was really in a way closing the circle. And that was the moment when my Israel began. But I also think it was the moment when, when our Israel began, the Israel that we know, the Israel that, that, that for, better, for better and for worse, that we've, uh, we've all grown up with. And, and the summer of 67 was the moment <clears throat> when uh, all of our options suddenly were put on the table. Suddenly everything became possible. Peace with Egypt, land for peace, uh, greater Israel, fulfilling the, the, the dream of wholeness, wholeness of the land. Uh, it's the moment when the Soviet Jewry Renaissance began literally the summer of 67. I think it's the moment when the American Jewish Renaissance began as well, partly in response to, uh, to both the Six Day War and how deeply Soviet Jews were affected. So, so for all those reasons, I, I felt that 67 was the place to begin. And, there, and I would add one more reason as a writer. 
which is that uh, one of the, the novels that had the deepest impact on me as I was becoming a, a young writer was uh, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. And Midnight's Children is the story of a group of young Indians who are born literally on midnight, which is when India is declared a state. And it tells the story through novelistic form of that first generation of, of Indians. And I wanted to tell a story about the first generation of sovereign Israelis, those who, grew, who were born around the time of the, of the creation of the state, as most of the characters in this book were, and to tell a kind of Jewish Midnight's Children. So it's as if 48 really started in 67. I think that, that, that 48 somehow um, was prelude. This is when, yes, th that's 67 right. was Israel's independence day. I think that's, that's a really good way to put it. That in, thank you. That Independence Day, you, you, when, when you read the title, like dreamers, the story of the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation. You know, and I look at the, the picture, and like this is a picture which you see their hope, like we're all dreamers, but like your title is a contradiction a little bit. It's a story of dreamers, but people who divided a nation. So on the one hand, it's a story of, of hope. This Independence Day is a story of hope, and from the beginning, it's, it's, it's a story of Khurban, of destruction. When you came, what was your relationship between the dreamers and those who divided the nation? When, when you're, like, you came to, this is like a very, very ambivalent title. Right. Like, is, is your soul divided? Well, look, first of all, we, the, the, the very phrase, like dreamers, kicholmin, from Shir HaMalot, that we all sing and we all take for granted. I, I've always been fascinated with the k, like. What does that mean, like dreamers? Why not? We were, we were dreamers. We were like dreamers. So you're in a state where you're like dreaming, but you're not actually dreaming. You're awake. And, and so what I felt about these characters, and, and, I, and I think about, about Israeli society and, and, and the Jewish people generally after the Shoah, uh, in, after 67, was that we were like dreamers, but we were also very practical. And these men, these seven men who I focus on in the book, each of them is trying to shape Israel in a definite political, cultural, even economic way. And each of them is trying to take responsibility for the Israel which they helped create on the battlefield. And so they're all dreamers, all seven of them. They all have grand, even grandiose visions about Israel, and yet they're very practical. They're like dreamers, but these are, these are, these are activists. These are people working in the world. And this is, let's, this delve into, let's delve into them for a moment, because in fact, when you read the book, there's different types of heroes in the book. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are heroes who are, dreamer, who are like dreamers, and some of them, as you tell it, are heroes who divided the nation. Um, when you read the book, there's two who are clearly your favorite. There's two who somehow speak to you, um, Arik, Achmon, and uh, Yol Binun. There's no doubt that, those, they're, that either they're your heroes, they're the ones you fell in love with, and there's the one, they're the ones who somehow touch your soul the deepest. What is it about each one of them? What is it about, Ach and they're diff what is it about each one of them that, that of these seven, mm -hmm. they are... All are maybe heroes or not, or figures who, why are they your hero? What is it about them? Well, first of all, you're right. It's, it is those two. And uh, they are, uh, they're the people that I feel in some way closest to in terms of their Israel, their vision of Israel. And I would divide the characters in this book into two camps, and it's not necessarily left and right or kibbutzniks and settlers. But uh, those who evolve over the course of the 40 years that this story is told, and those who pretty much stay the same. And when you encounter them as a reader in May 1967, they have a certain idea about the country and about themselves in the world, and they pretty much hold on to that 
no matter what happens over the next 40 years. And the two characters that you mentioned are those who I think evolve the most. Uh, Arik Achmon, who is the great military hero of the book, he is uh, on the Temple Mount together with Matagur, the commander of the paratroopers. They are the first Jews, the first soldiers, Jewish soldiers, on the Temple Mount in 1800 years. Uh, and uh, Arik Achmon leads the crossing of the Suez Canal in 1973, which turns the battle in Israel's favor. So the two most mythic battles, 67 in Jerusalem, the victory at the Suez Canal, both belong to Arik Achmon. And what, what moves me, though, especially about Arik, was that as you, as you go along with him through the years, you see the evolution of a very one-dimensional, seemingly one-dimensional, uh, Sabra, someone who is, uh, uh, is, is, is out of touch with his emotions, someone who is all focused on doing rather than feeling and absorbing. And gradually, the Israeli story is getting to him. And he begins to crack open. And you see the evolution. And for me, it's in some ways the most moving. But let's stick story. with Arik for a moment, because I think you spend most time on him. Mm -hmm. And like when you read the book, you think he's Forrest Gump. It's like, it's like <laughs> everything that happened in Israel since 1967, somehow Arik was the one right there. He's like, you know, like, it's like you read it, it's like, it's like I, I, him again. It's like I thought he's, you know, Chas You like, don't know that he was one of the founders of the Hartman Institute. Of the Hartman Institute. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, it's like, it's like yeah, he's the first one here, and he's the first one here, and he's the first one to think of the wall, and he's it's like, it's like, like in one person, it's like, it's like, could he really be for real? But, but you, the story, when you tell the story of Arik, at least as I, I don't, there is that transformation. His wife starts to teach him to stop being such a soft on the inside, but a creep on the outside. And you know, like how to, you know, be sensitive and listen to people and talk and all of, but you, when you write, you are loving. This is a man who you believe, he's like one of those great people who is the shoulder, like, you know, they're the shoulders of Israel. And, and I don't, it's not his transfer, it's like there's some love that you have. Yes, yes. That, that, that This is like, you're here, this is the best of Israel? Yes, this is a guy, I once asked him his definition of Zionism, and he said to deal with reality as it is, without self-pity. Now that's an extraordinary definition, and I think that he is precisely right. Because the old secular Zionists, and I'm thinking about Mapai, for example, the old pioneers, those, those, those curmudgeons, those self-righteous, you know, Golda Meir and Ben-Gurion and Eshkol, who always knew the answer whether they knew it or not, they, they, their greatness was that they said, okay, this is the Jewish situation in the 20th century. These are the cards that we've been dealt, and we're going to turn this around. We're going to make the best of it. That's Arik Achman. That is the soul of secular Zionism. But he's more than that. He's, he's a hero. Oh, he's, he's, it's like he is a hero. you tell every single military. It's like That's you're, right. you're, I'm, 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 I'm a fan. You're, it's like, no, it's no. like I feel it's yeah. like you're the, it's like this, like you feel like someone from out of it. Like these are the people who we could thank for having this. Like if That's we're right. thankful for Israel, like yes. there's a few people like that, and like you found the person who, who gave us this gift. When I, when I first started interviewing him, Arik had just turned 70. He just, now he, he's turned 81 just, just recently. Uh, his birthday, his Hebrew birthday, is the, is the beginning of the Six Day War. And, um, and when I first met him, he was on his way to total oblivion. And he said to me, you know, you're an American-born Jew, you'll never understand this story. But I don't have anyone else knocking on my door. <laughs> and he said, this is what he said to me. And uh, he said, you know, um, he said, I, I have to write my story, but I won't. So I'm going to take a, a gamble on you. And, um, and one of the, the real... He didn't want Yisrael Harel to write it. No, he, he, but he, that's he, for those of you who read Know the Book. Anyway, you should have laughed at that. You didn't read it yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so he, he Tell me a little bit about Yol Binun, who you give... Um, the honor of being the last voice in the book, which is basically um, your voice. Yeah. But there is, without doubt, the, the amount 
after Arik, Yoel is, is, is your hero. What is it about him that you well, find so powerful? Well, uh, unlike Arik, I, I, I had never really met anybody like Arik. I'd never had a friend like Arik, totally opposite personalities. Uh, he is the soul of pragmatism, and, and I'm not. This took, me, this took me more than 10 years to write. And, uh, and, uh, and, and with Yoel bin Nun, I, I really identified with him. And what I identified with was his, his, uh, his extremism. I, I grew up in, uh, in Brooklyn in the 1960s, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I was a, I would, you know, I was a teenage werewolf. I was a teenage follower of Mayor Kahana, and uh, I was in the JDL and 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 Beitar. I come very much from that world, and we're pluralists here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, except that I didn't stay there. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna have to work harder on my. <laughs> okay, I'll have to find another token. Okay. So uh, and and. And it was exactly that point, though, of making that journey, of starting in a, in a, in a place of, of absolutist ideology. You know exactly what the Jewish people should do at all times. And Yol bin Nun, when the reader first encounters him, is, uh, is on his way to becoming the, the theologian, the young, among the younger generation, of the settlement movement. Uh, he founds uh, a number of settlements. Of, he's one of the founders of Ofra, of, uh, of Alon Shvut in, in Kfar Etzion, and, and of course of Gush Amunim, of the settlement movement. And gradually, he realizes that the different parts of his ideology are contradicting each other. His longing for the wholeness of the land of Israel and his profound commitment to the wholeness of the Jewish people, you can't have both. You're going to have to choose. And if you insist on the wholeness of the land, you are going to be dividing the Jewish people. And so he gradually, he, he first, he denies this. And for years, he does everything he can to rationalize to himself that it's not true. And he finds all the, all the, the, the rabbinic verses that the Jewish people is united when the land is, when we're back in the land. It's the land, and there's a quote from the Zohar that, uh, that when the more, the more we're in the land, the more we're united. And that's his answer at first. But the more Israeli society begins to unravel in the 70s and the 80s, as a direct consequence to what he and his friends are doing, he realizes that he's going to have to choose. And his, his breaking point, <clears throat> is the Rabin assassination. And that's when he becomes the great heretic of the settlement movement. Now, what's so interesting, we were talking about this before, what's so interesting about Yol bin Nun <clears throat> is that he becomes a heretic in terms of how he's perceived by his friends or his former friends. And yet, in himself, he continues to believe completely in the ideology that always defined his life but he realizes that he can't implement that ideology. That's the tragedy of his life, and that's the tragedy as he experiences it for this generation. This is the generation that returns to the land, to, to Judea and Samaria, and this is the generation that's going to have to part from the land. So but let's push deeper because you know, whenever you see an author letting somebody else be the last voice in his book, um, pay attention. Um, uh, what is it <coughs> about him? Is it just the fact that he was a tragic figure? No. no is no, there something, of, what is it about him that, that is basically your voice, Yossi? Why is, he, why is he your voice? Look, I can tell you what it is that I love about him. And that's, first of all, his courage. And you, you talked about Arik Achmon before. Arik Achmon is the, is the military expression of courage. And Yol bin Nun is the civilian expression of courage. In the army, he was a corporal. He, uh, he was there, but he had no particularly heroic role, and he's the first to admit it. 
at where his heroism came, came, came shining through was in his ability to examine his own deepest held beliefs. And, and when I mentioned before that I divide the book into two, two camps, the characters into two camps, those who remain the same and those who had the courage to evolve, I don't know of anyone in Israeli society, in Jewish life, who, who has paid a greater price for challenging the camp that was his ideological home for his entire life. Mm -hmm. and, and he did it, he, 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 he shattered his own safe place of home in order to try to help reunify the Jewish people. And he did it after the Rabin assassination. He emerged as the great national unifier in those terrible weeks. And I, I, I believe that he played an historic role. I want to come back to him uh, again a little later. Um, let's move for a moment to um, the unbelievably dominant place that Gush Munim, the group of the, of the faithful, the settler movement, plays um, in this book. Um, there, the way you tell it, there are two types of service. There's the Ari Kachmon service of whenever they call him, he's there. He, he work, he's like, he does Miluim half a year, every year. It's like he's, he, he just, the country calls and he's there. But you, you don't only tell a loving story of Ari Kachmon and military service. There is a very deep respect and love um, for the way you talk about Gushim, it's ambivalent. But there is, there is a sense of service that defines this community. Um, <coughs> what is it about Gushim Munim that, that, that led you to believe, that led you to give it to so, why are you giving it so much space? Um, a lot of things happened in Israel since 67, <coughs> um, and they're not in the book. Right. Um, Gushim Munim, this is a story of Gushim Munim. What is the story of Gushim Munim that you want to tell and that you feel is so critical to tell? Because what you're saying is that if you want to understand Israel, you have to understand Gush Emunim. You know, Arik uh, Achmon, who, who has become my, my closest friend among any of the characters here, said to me recently, you know, your, your head is OK, but your heart is all screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you're, you, he says, you understand intellectually that the settlement position is untenable, but your heart is really with them. And, uh, Yaholiot, maybe. And uh, so, so in, a, in a way, I think that's, that's a starting point for me. I, I come from, from the world that produced, as, as do you. Uh, we come from that world. I didn't come from that world. Well, you, you know, you <laughs> studied in uh, the yeshiva. They, well, yeah, you, you, were the, you, came, you were the heretics of yeah, that I was world. Yeah, I was the heretic <laughs> from the beginning. But yes, please, you came from that. Yeah. I, I, I came from, the wor from that world. My friends, who I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, with, uh, became, were the founders of Tekoa Settlement in the West Bank. And come join us, you know, this is, this is the next step after, after the Soviet mission and, uh, and the demonstrations. And, and so there really is, I, 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 have, I, I have a great deal emotionally invested in that world. What is it about and, them that, that, that you're emotionally so invested in? What is it that they embody? Because today everybody speaks, it's like it's, you know, Gush Emunim is like the group of the faithful, the nutcase. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's a, a, what, there's something very deep about them that, 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 that inspires you. These are the people who did what an earlier generation of kibbutzniks did, which is take the Jewish people, or try to take the Jewish people on their back. Take responsibility for the future of of, uh, of the Jewish story. Whether or not they succeeded, let's leave that aside for a moment. But when they see themselves as the heir of the kibbutz, kibbutzniks, which also drives Arik, who was an old kibbutznik, mad, uh, I, 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 respect, I respect that in the sense that these are people who live and breathe the Jewish story and, and the Jewish future. The, um, you know, you asked, you asked a, a really, in some ways, I think the most important question 
for me in, in approaching this book. What is the Israeli story? What is the heart of this story? And here I would, there are many ways in which one could divide classical Zionism. There's left and right, there's, there's territorial maximalists, partitionists, clericalists, anti-clericalists. The most interesting way for me to divide Zionism is between the camp of the normalizers and the camp of the exceptionalists or the utopian dreamers. And in the camp of the exceptionalists, you have the old kibbutzniks and you have the religious Zionists. These are the two streams of Zionism that believed that we came home not merely to create a safe refuge for the Jewish people, uh, although I say merely, you know, can, if only we, 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 we had succeeded they in doing know, that, yes, really. That. They know. But that wasn't enough for them. The kibbutzniks, the old kibbutzniks, believed that we were coming home to bring world redemption through socialism. The settlers, Gushamunim, believed that we had come home to bring, literally, to bring Mashiach. So these were variations of that same Jewish impulse with which Jews always related. When Jews imagined the return to Zion, it was always seen in messianic terms. And so these are the two movements that in some way remained most faithful to classical Jewish understanding of what the return to Zion and to would your be. soul. To my soul, and to absolutely. what you love about this. I, I, I am a, a, a closet messianist. You're a closet. Let's talk about these. Uh, I know that's what's so beautiful about you. Um, uh, let's talk about these closet messiness because it's a story that you tell with great love, um, great respect, um, and it, it's, it, it defines for you the essential Zionist, deepest Zionist narrative. Um, Peace Now, for example, almost doesn't exist in your book. Um, it's interesting. Um, and they've, they dovetailed. One became successful while the other. But, but when you look at this group, this group which you talk a tremendous amount and tell us almost the miraculous story of how they succeeded to do something, um, at the end, you ultimately accuse them through the personality of Yoel Binun of dividing the nation. Um, and um, what did they get wrong in your mind? The, um, the fatal flaw of, uh, of the settlement movement, and, I, and I'm speaking now of the religious, the messianic settlement movement, was to turn a deeply morally problematic dilemma that Israel faced of occupying another people uh, into the arena for its religious ecstasy. And for the settlers to completely ignore the moral consequences of occupying another people and to say that this is where redemption, redemption is going to happen through this process of occupying another people is to so totally misunderstand what redemption is about. Redemption is not a private Jewish story. Redemption is a story of, for, for humanity. This was the part of humanity that we were living with most intimately, is the that Palestinians. Yol, it's interesting. It's Yol bin Nun. No, you see, yes. you're now, what I'm hearing now is, is Yossi Klein Halevi, 2014, and I want to come back to that. Because maybe I didn't hear it, but Yol bin Nun's critique of Gush Emunim is very, very different. You don't sense from Yol Binun a moral critique of the occupation. You sense from Yol Binun a critique that Gush Emunim is, is placing its ideology above Israel and above the unity of the Jewish people. It was Yitzhak Rabin's death yes. that got yes. him, not... So yes, what, what think, is it? I think you're right. You're right in the sense that... If you could do both. You know, we'll have a next version yeah. you could add, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, what, what is it? Look, it is. I, I think you're right that the the weight of Yol's judgment on his community was that it it placed the unity of the land above the unity of the Jewish people, and it was even ready to risk uh, the abyss, the total shattering of the Jewish people for the sake and of, of the of state continue. of Israel and, and government and whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. And Yol Binun, 
uh, believed deeply in, in what Ben Gurion called mamlachtiut. Um, I don't even know how, how would one translate that. Uh, placing the, the uh, I, don't know. I don't know, states, a loyalty Statism. to the state. No, it's not. Um, Call it above, uh, let's say, a loyalty to the collective and the, and the democratic institutions of the state yeah. above the sectarian needs of your own community. Right. Okay, so, and Yol bin Nun really deeply believed that. That was his deepest passion. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you, but, take, if you take the two stories you just told, mm -hmm. these two flaws, mm -hmm. um, let's go beyond the book because you're not a historian. Um, anybody who knows you knows that you are an educator in your soul. You use writing as a vehicle. But you want to shape the way the Jewish people think about Israel. You're a lover of Israel. And you are writing this book because you want this book to shape the way we look at the state of Israel and the way Jews connect to the state of Israel. And you don't want us to repeat the same mistakes. So if Gusha Munim produced like dreamers who ended up dividing a nation and your hero is Yoel Binun, and you say, those two ideas, using those categories today. Forget the book ends in 204, in 2004. You're now in 214. Who are the dreamers today who are dividing the nation? The, um, the story that this book tells, is a, it's a cautionary tale about uh, about placing one's ideology uh, above reality. <clears throat> and in that sense, I would certainly include peace now in the critique of this book. And um, so what worries me most deeply about the Jewish people today is I fear the absolutist commitments of the different camps and I fear Jewish disappointment. And if I can just break that down for a moment. Um, on the Orthodox side, <clears throat> the Orthodox, the post-Holocaust Orthodox Renaissance, the, 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 the extraordinary comeback of the Orthodox community uh, after 100 years of enlightenment and then, then, then capped by the Shoah, and the ability of the Orthodox to rebuild themselves <clears throat> has been based in large part on, on two unsustainable projects in the long term. One is, is a, uh, an orthodox monopoly on religious life in Israel, and the other is on the settlement movement. These are the two, in some ways, energizing forces of orthodoxy that convinced the orthodox world not only that it has a future, but in some ways that it is the future. And I think that both of these phenomena are, um, are transient. And I, I am very afraid of the shattering and the disappointment in the Orthodox world when these two victories are taken away from them. What will, what will happen to the Orthodox world when they are no longer the dominant state religion here and when the settlement movement is confined to settlement blocks? And I want to push you further <coughs> because I want to ask a more difficult question. You're telling me what's your what's going to cause damage. This is a book about what will divide a nation. Well, this is exactly what I'm getting well, at. This is exactly it. Is that what, what I, when I say that I'm, I fear their disappointment, who will, who will they turn their disappointment against? It will be against people like us who supported religious pluralism in they'll Israel. They'll walk away. They'll, they, they, there is a great danger of, of, of a return of radical sectarianism in the Orthodox world, of saying, the rest of you, you've sold out. The rest of you are corrupt. And, uh, and we could find ourselves, in some sense, in the way that, in the situation in the Second Temple. That was Orthodox half the coin. <clears throat> What's the other half? The other half of the liberal Jews. And uh, liberal. So you got everybody, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to be fair here to everybody. <clears throat> the liberal Jews who, um, who, who, in the 1990s, uh, believed that their Israel was going to, to prevail and that uh, peace now was the future. And we may actually may not have a peace agreement with the Palestinians, maybe not in our generation. And, I, and will liberal Jews be able to sustain their connection to Israel 
if, if their scenario doesn't play out. And, uh, and I think we're beginning to see an answer to that. So the window into your soul <laughs> is that regardless of your ideology, your love and commitment to the Jewish people has to be greater. You can never create an ideology Absolutely. that you're so committed to Absolutely. that you can walk away from the Jewish people as a result. That's exactly That's right. Yossi Klein Halevi's definition of who is a Jew. I, I accept that. Okay. Okay. I think it's a good one. Thank you. Um, you wrote in this book, um, one or two more questions and then we'll open up. Uh, you, your deep condemnation of Gush Munim here is that they divided a nation. And uh, it wasn't just that they are be willing to walk away, but that they created something in which we lost our, our, our collectivity. And I think that was correct in 2004. When I look at Israel in 214, would I say that Gush Munim divided the nation? I don't know. I don't know if Israelis <coughs> are, if settlements is a divisive issue anymore. Um, if, um, if peace is not part of the non-utopian aspirations, you know, and as, you know, as utopia means, we all, what is utopia? Nowhere. That's literally what it means, you know, and so the, uh, um, if it's nowhere, it's definitely not here, then I'm not really, you know, okay, remember, who's built, who's expanding settlements? It's not just Gush Emunim, it's the the mainstream governments of Israel. It's not illegal in that sense. There's, there's a ve and it's not just the complicitly, complicitness of the, of the government. Israeli society is not demonstrating settlement expansion. They're not losing sleep over settlement expansion. That's, if we're honest about Israeli society today, Israeli society is in another place. Um, I don't know if Gush Emunim is dividing Israel or did they really win? Because wasn't their ideology create facts on the ground? <laughs> You create facts on the ground, it will be. And haven't Israelis just made peace um, <laughs> with that react, made peace with not having peace? And then, would you do you think they've still divided the nation, or did they actually succeed in moving us into another place and to accept, without any messianic ideology, the fact that greater Israel is just part of what we have now, maybe to be separated from it another time, but definitely not something to really vote on and to get really aggravated on. Um, um, we have other issues like apartments, um, et cetera, that we're, uh, more, we're, 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 we're worried about. It's interesting, Daniel, because uh, you and I for years have really been saying more or less the same thing, that, that a majority of Israelis, there's a new Israeli center. Most Israelis want peace. They just don't believe that it's possible now. And what you're suggesting is that we're in a new phase. Well, I'm, I'm asking, I'm wondering, like after I read your book, mm -hmm. are we in a new you phase? You meant to depress me in a different way. You depressed me in another way. Yeah, well, now, <laughs> now you're depressing me. <laughs> no, like it just, it caused me to think very seriously because there's a, there's a serious condemnation. And, um, you know, and you paint Hanan Parat, I understand the, the radical, I, like, the, like, you know, coming to, um, to Kirat Arba, and whether he meant to say Chag Sapurim Sameach or not, you know, and he was deeply, but like, you're living in your own, the picture you tell is of a group of people living in their own private conversation. I don't know if that's, you know, there, there's, what is it, hundreds of thousands of people. They live there for multiple reasons. Many Israelis move there to improve their economic. Is there, have they really created a new Israel and what does that mean for us and for the stories that we tell Look, I, and what I, we have to work on? I still think that, uh, that two things have happened in terms of the relationship of the Israeli mainstream to the settlements and the settlers. One is that settlers are considered by the mainstream to be part of them. And uh, that's true culturally, certainly in the army. It's one of the great achievements of the, this generation of religious Zionists. Uh, but the second is that a majority of the public is still prepared, that's at least what the polls show, in principle, if not in practice, to dismantle a large part of the uh, settlement infrastructure. And although the numbers are going down, you know, for, for, for many years, the numbers were between 70 and 75% of the Israeli public supported a two-state solution 
which of course means giving up most of the settlements, or many. And lately I've seen the polls hovering between 60 and 65 percent. And I think that that's partly an expression of the coming of age of, uh, of the generation of our kids who grew up in the Second Intifada. Our generation remembers the First Intifada, Lebanon, the First Lebanon War. Inti you, you were drafted in the First Lebanon War. I was drafted in the First Intifada. Those were our traumas. Our kids' generation were drafted after the peace failed. And the prevailing Israeli narrative to this day, which I think, I don't think uh, many American Jews have, have fully internalized, is that the year 2000 was a historic shattering of, of the peace process. In many ways, it, psychologically, it had the same impact as the 1947 rejection of partition by the Arab world and the Palestinian leadership. That was the impact on the younger generation. These were the kids, I mean, my kids, two of, the, my, of my three kids were teenagers in those terrible years of 2000 to 2004, riding buses every day in Jerusalem. And that's their, that's their piece. And so what we're starting to see, and I think you're, you're really touching on this, is uh, we may not be able to be saying this forever, that a majority of Israelis really believe in a two-state solution. I don't know if you saw the news today. There was a poll that was just released on the Palestinian side. And there is now a majority, even a strong majority, against a two-state solution. Let's, in order to finish maybe on, uh, on, on, on to add one last dimension, because there's... A little more positive. No, it's not just, but there's just <laughs> so many dimensions to this book. There's one other person who you love in this book. There's other people you talk and, mm. you know, you'll talk with <coughs> them, but you don't love them. Uh, the other person who you clearly love in this book is Avital Geva. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think he's really, when you said that you're... The, the heroes in this book are our people who evolve. Avital Geva doesn't evolve. He's an old-time kibbutznik. You're right. And he stays an old-time kibbutznik. And as the rest of the country is going wherever it goes, he's still in his, what is it called, the hothouse or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, the greenhouse. Planting, planting his greenhouse, planting his cucumbers. Um, he's this, and you could have told the story lots of different ways. You could have told the story about the loneliness of Avital Geva, his insignificance, how the kibbutz movement is moving to economic, is giving up its socialist ideologies, leaving its, its you know, and instead you leave this one guy as this, you know, this, he's the only one who doesn't change and he wins. Um, he's really the only one who, in a certain sense, wins. Yol Binun is a tragic figure. Uh, uh, Achmon in a certain, uh, Arik, life, you know, the challenges of everyday Israel were never the same. He did, now he didn't do some bad things, but it was like time passed him by. The only mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. who really wins is Avital <coughs> Geva. What is it about what he stands for that, 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 that you want to hold on to as an essential part that you don't want to take away from Israel? Because by keeping Avital Geva around, that stays a part of Israel. He is. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, he is the last standing messianist in the book, <clears throat> even though he comes from a Hashomer Atzair kibbutz. And um, he deeply believes that the soul of Israel is its narrative. And that we, what the, the, the crisis in Israel today is because we don't have a vision. vision. And if you think about what classical Zionism really, really was, it was the meeting point between necessity and longing. And what has seemingly prevailed in, in Israeli society today, and I think this is also the real source of the crisis in the diaspora Israel relations, is that we are now left with the Zionism of necessity. If there's any Zionism left at all, that's what it is. We don't have a Zionism of longing. We don't have a vision. And for me, Avital is the most religious person in this book, even though he probably doesn't fast on Yom Kippur. Forgive me, Avital, maybe you do. I, but, uh, but Avital really is, 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 the, is 
that Zionist intuition that understood that the, that the, that the longing piece of our return to Zion was essential for our survival, that ultimately there would be no fulfillment of the Zionism of necessity if we, if we, if we don't hold on to the Zionism of longing. And it's interesting because the, the, this book really tells the story of a kind of civil war within the camp of the utopians, That's right. the religious Zionists versus the secular kibbutzniks. What it doesn't tell is the camp that won, which is the camp of the normalizers. Right now, if you freeze frame, freeze the frame to, uh, of Israeli history to the present, the victor is, seems to be Tel Aviv. The two, the two camps of utopians fought each other and both became, to a large extent, irrelevant. The settlement movement still, obviously, is very relevant politically. It is not relevant in the way it hoped to be in its early years, which was to be a spiritual avant-garde in the way that the early kibbutz movement was. So in that sense, uh, the, the, it, Avital represents the challenge to normalizing Israel. And there he is, stubbornly growing cucumbers in his greenhouse. And you want to still, Yossi Klein Halevi, forget Abital for a moment, wants to, from Jerusalem, look at Tel Aviv and tell them to come back and grow cucumbers. To say that we, need, we need what Tel Aviv is, we but need, it's not enough. We need something else. We need something else. Yossi, um, I know it's mundane, but uh, um, thank you for writing not over a beautiful book, but writing a great book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, please. Um, yes, please. How you doing, How you doing Jack? Which your favorite character was obviously not a Torah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting to go back to the origins of the movement. And this, this, this uh, touches on, on one of the questions you asked about what it is that I love about them, is that initially it actually had nothing to do this with security. Thing. The first two settlements that were founded, mm -hmm. September 67 was Kfar Etzion, and then April Pesach uh, 1968 was the Jewish community in Hebron. And what was so interesting about both those communities is that they were reconstructions of Jewish communities that had existed in the living memory of Israelis. This, this was not a return to the ancient biblical land of Israel, initially. It was a fulfillment, it was re... It the was Shavu Banim the they, the But children, literally, 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 they were coming home. Exactly, these were the orphans of Kfar Etzion, whose parents were massacred, whose fathers were massacred, uh, on the literal eve of Israeli independence returning 19 years later to their literal birthplace. And in, in terms of Hebron, uh, it was also, it, that was a Jewish community that existed until 1929. The two great traumas up until the creation of the state for, for, the, for the Yishuv, for the Jewish community in pre-state Israel, was the destruction of Gush Etzion and the destruction of the Jewish community in Hebron. So initially, this had nothing to do with either security, and it had nothing to do with the biblical claim. 
which became the two animating principles of the settlement movement subsequently. Thank you. Um, yes, please, sir, in the back. I write in English. Un unfortunately, There's that's six the and a quarter million <laughs> Jews here in Israel, <laughs> and they read a lot. <laughs> Are you asking in terms of how American Jews relate to Israel or the? Well, I, I, I spent about five months or six months of the, of the last year traveling Jewish communities in North America. And I very often felt like I was in a time warp. Uh, when, I would, when I would speak to Orthodox communities, it was the 70s and the 80s. And it was the good old days of Begin and Shamir. And all we needed to do was be determined, stake our claim to the land. And, and somehow, the Middle East would, would accept our will. Uh, when I would speak to liberal Jewish communities, it was the 1990s. And it was the years of, of the peace process. And all we need to do was to have the will to sign the agreement, because we all know exactly what the agreement is going to look like anyway, and we have a peace partner, and just stop building those, those settlements, and, and, uh, and we'll, have, we'll have peace. And, and the, the Orthodox communities, by and large, failed uh, already in the late 1980s to understand that the first intifada for a majority of Israelis meant the end of the dream of greater Israel. And the second intifada of the early 2000s shattered the dream of peace now. And I feel that much of the American Jewish community is still living in, in, in those dreams that most Israelis uh, very painfully, traumatically, have, uh, have given up. Thank you. We'll take just, 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 just what's, I apologize, because there's just a lot. I'm going to take one more on this side, and then I'm going to go to this side, and then I'll come back. Yes, please, sir. Well, I, I stopped it in 2004 for several reasons. Uh, one was my editor, <laughs> honest, <laughs> honestly. Uh, secondly, because uh, I wanted to end with Yoel bin Nun going back to the battle route of Jerusalem. And he take every year on the eve of Jerusalem Day, he takes his students on that route. And I've done that route with him now for, for many years. Uh, but uh, that particular year, he took a group of secular students along with his yeshiva students. And it was, it was a fantastic scene. And I wanted to end the book with the yeah. Jewish people coming together through Yol Bin Nun. And that happened on What a utopia. It's like you're the, yes, it, you're yes, the, it's, it's like it's a messi it was a messianic <laughs> moment. It, that was my Jerusalem day. That was your the, Jerusalem yeah, day. Exactly. Wow. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of, of the comment that I made on, uh, in that interview, uh, I, had, uh, I devoted uh, quite a bit of space in the book to the withdrawal from Sinai and Yamit in 1982. And I didn't have the energy, either, either as a writer or as an Israeli, to go through that trauma again uh, in 2005 of the withdrawal from Gaza. And uh, I, I supported the withdrawal from Gaza. I supported it publicly. I wrote, I wrote, uh, ver I wrote um, very strongly in support of the withdrawal at the time. And I don't regret that we withdrew. I, I may regret the way in which we, 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 we implemented the withdrawal. But I still think we are far better off being out of there than in there. Uh, but it was so painful for me 
that I, um, I got on a plane immediately after the withdrawal and just went to Turkey, which may not be an option today, but I <laughs> did, did, did it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, please. And then in the back, I think there was someone in the back, and then yourself. I telling that, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, what's new? What's happening? <laughs> what's going on? And in particular, not only what's going on in their lives, but what's going on in, in terms of the state of the dialogue, if any, for them and, and for the broader Israeli community. How much conversation and what kind of quality is going on? You know, I think that, that um, in many ways the, the story that this book tells uh, is more history than current events. Uh, Israel today is not animated by, by these two camps that, that are almost equally dividing uh, our society in the way that, that we did in the 1980s and especially the 1990s. Uh, there's been some kind of healing uh, an enforced, an enforced healing that, uh, that was created uh, by the Second Intifada in particular. And, and as, as a result of that, I think that, that many Israelis today have internalized the left-right split. So that it's not happening only out there, but it's happening inside many of us. And we, we're arguing that. And you know, I, I, I have, and as I'm sure many of us have, uh, there were left-wing mornings, you wake up and you say, just get out of there, no matter what. And there were right-wing mornings when you say, look around at this region, and you say, How, what are you thinking? How could you possibly give up control over the, the last border that we do have control over on both sides, and it's our most sensitive border, overlooking the coastal plain. So, so I think that, that the, the vehemence of this left-right divide has, has really been internalized in, in many cases. That's not to say that we don't have these strong ideological camps more on the right than, than, than what's, what remains on the left. So, so that's a reflection, I think, of, of Israeli society. I think Israeli society is, is very tired of these arguments. People, we just don't, we just don't, we don't conduct those arguments anymore. You know, you don't have, sitting around the Friday night table, I can't remember the last time, I had an argument with anybody. I have arguments with, with American Jews. I argue with right-wing American Jews, with left-wing American Jews. Uh, but here, not really. Isn't, isn't that your experience? This is your night. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to unpack that. No, 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 and I, again, I, I concur. There's no great profundity behind that. Um, um, yes, ma'am, in the back, I saw your hand, and then yourself, sir. Uh, well, let me answer the, the second question first because it's more, more immediate. Uh, the, the book that, that, uh, that, that is being referred to uh, was a book that I published in 2001 about a journey uh, that I took into Islam and Christianity. And then the second intifada really just knocked that out of me and I, I put that book aside. But in recent years, I've become more pulled, I've been pulled back uh, increasingly into attempts to revive a Muslim-Jewish conversation, and that's something that we've been doing here at, uh, at the Machon. Uh, we have a program where we bring uh, young, emerging Muslim-American leaders to study uh, Israel and the Jewish connection to this land, sovereignty, peoplehood, and uh, we've just graduated our first uh, class of 15 people. So in a way, that the hope of that journey, uh, which uh, was uh, suspended for me for many years, has now become reactivated. And I'm just thrilled that that's happening here at the Machon. Uh, in terms of uh, your first question, I, I have to just say, in, in all uh, uh, frankness, in, in, in the most simple way possible, I, I believe in, uh, in, in, in a divine presence and history. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that things will work out well. We know that. 
there's no, there's no, there's no guarantee. And in fact, this was just said very movingly by one of the mothers of the, of, uh, of the kidnapped boys, uh, the American woman, Frankel. She was at the wall a few nights ago and she ran into a group of, uh, of school children who had come to the wall to pray for, for the kids. And she told them, uh, I believe with full faith that the boys will come back, but if they don't come back, you children should not lose your faith. And she said, God doesn't work for me and I don't know his calculations. So the one thing I, I'd say we can draw two conclusions from Jewish history. One is that we always persevere, and the other is just barely. So, uh, so touch and go there. So. Please, yes. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll divide that into, into two responses. One, political leadership, the other is religious leadership. Uh, the political leadership, I, 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 don't, I think it's, it's, it's a forlorn hope to expect that we will produce the kinds of leaders we had in the early years of the state. Those circumstances, uh, in, for worse and in, and in many cases for better, are gone and we are dealing with a new set of problems. And if you look at the evolution or devolution of Israeli leadership, uh, it reflects the evolution of Israeli society. There seems to be an inverse relationship. Uh, the more that Israeli society thrives and, and, and progresses, the more our, our leadership declines. And there is a certain quality of leadership that an austere, uh, that austere circumstances produce. And I, and I don't miss those, those circumstances. I, I do not long for the old Israel. And I think that's, that's, there's, there's a certain, um, I think, misplaced nostalgia uh, among some Israelis and, and many American Jews for the old labor Israel, which in many ways, if we leave out the, the occupation, leave out post the, 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 the post-Green Line, Israeli, Israel today is far more democratic than it was under, under labor. The Likud, paradoxically, created a more pluralistic Israel, certainly ethnically. And so, and so in that sense, I think that, that what's happened is that we are in a, a crisis of leadership because we are a more prosperous society. And look at, we're, we've just sentenced a prime minister to jail for six years for, for bribery. That's an expression of, of of changing circumstances here. Uh, I do believe, though, that there are pockets, large pockets of Israeli society that are, are deeply idealistic, deeply committed to, to a sense of service. What will be different in the future, I think, than in the past was in the past, we expected leadership to come out of particular communities. They're either going to come out of the kibbutz movement or then the religious Zionist movement tried to, to replace that and create a, a generation of, of, of a, new, a new wave of leadership. I think that the next phase of leadership will come from all sectors of Israeli society. We, we don't have a, an avant-garde anymore in that sense. Uh, in terms of, uh, of religious leadership, Look, I, uh, I believe that uh, we are at a, at a tremendous moment in, in the evolution of, uh, of Judaism, of Israeli Judaism, and religious revolutions always begin in, in the grassroots and take generations to, to emerge, and then suddenly it happens, and, and you wonder where did that come from, but I think the grounds are being prepared now, and, um, and I see a, a growing post-secularism of young, formerly secular Israelis who are not orthodox but are looking for spirituality. And I see some movement within the, within the religious Zionist community and even some post-orthodox. And, and there's a new incohate ground that is emerging 
which I think, uh, which certainly the Machon has been one of the prime nurturers of this ground. And uh, I think that uh, we are preparing the way for a, a spiritual renaissance. Oh, we have time for one last question. Yes, ma'am, in the back. It's a great question, and I, 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 ask, I ask myself that question th throughout the, the, the writing of this book. And, and I, I still don't have a, a definitive answer. What, what I do, however, feel is that there was no way we as a people could have avoided these movements. And here I'll speak about the peace movement as well, and I'll speak about the peace now as a kind of utopian movement. More, more, let's leave the kibbutz movement out of it because in terms of the present, we're really, we've been shaped, uh, this, this generation has been shaped either by the peace movement or the settlement movement. And, and I feel that both of these movements were, were legitimate, almost essential expressions of the Jewish soul in the sense that there is no way we could have come back to Judea and Samaria under the conditions that we did in a, in a defensive war of survival without at least one part of the Jewish people saying, let's give it a try. Let's, let's, we, we, because otherwise all of this longing over, 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 over centuries for Hebron, for, for, for Shiloh, for all these places, I remember these pictures hanging on my grandmother's, uh, in, in my grandmother's living room of, of Kever Rachel and, and Hebron. All of that longing would somehow be, be, be retroactively nullified if there hadn't been a group within the Jewish people that said, we're going to try to, to actualize our, our claim. And on the other hand, if there hadn't been another group within, within the people of Israel that said, we, we are a people of peace. Peace was, it has always been our highest value. And if we don't place peace above all other values, even our most cherished values, then there is, is, there is a fatal flaw in our moral being. And so when I, when I look at these two movements, I, I, I feel a certain uh, veneration, really. I, I'll use that strong a term. And, uh, and you know, Daniel, when you said that, that, that peace now almost doesn't exist in the book, that's true except for the origins. The, and the, the, one, of, one of my favorite parts of the book was that first peace now demonstration, 1978. Sadat has just come to Jerusalem, and, and, and Begin is not being as forthcoming. Peace now emerges not initially over the Palestinian issue, but to pressure Begin to reciprocate Sadat's generosity of spirit. And that first Peace Now demonstration is extraordinary. First of all, it's a sea of Israeli flags. And if you listen to the rhetoric of the speakers and you don't know it's a Peace Now demonstration, you could, you could imagine that you were at a demonstration of settlers because they were speaking of love of the land, speaking of security. One of the speakers was a reservist officer in Sayeret Matkal Israel's elite commando unit. There, is, there has not been another peace movement in history that was led by those who would be fighting the next war and leading the next war. So the origins of peace now I found to be one of the most inspiring Israeli stories. What eventually happened with peace now is it, for me is a different story and there I would put them in the same category of the settlers in that they, they insisted on placing ideology and wishful thinking ahead of reality. And there I think the peace, the peace movement and the settlement movement share that fatal flaw. But in terms of expressing uh, essential Jewish values, both of these movements, uh, I think, um, I think uh, embody uh, who we are as a people, but
but not separately. And this maybe is the fatal flaw of each of these movements. Each of them thinks we're the ones who embody the totality of Jewish values. And, and without a left and without a right, we, we are, uh, we, we are a, a, a fatally compromised people. Yossi, on behalf of everyone here, thank you very much.